the morning and it's uh, beautiful we have a slightly windy one here today in Christchurch this is episode 23 and it's day 19 of our national lockdown and it's uh, Easter Monday so welcome today we are um, concluding uh, Matthew well, we're right up to the last few verses so we're picking the narrative up in chapter 28 verses 16 through to 20 and tomorrow I intend to return to where I was before Easter and picking it up I think back in probably in about chapter 10 or 11 so here we are today Matthew 28 verses 16 through to 20 and these are the concluding verses of Matthew's Gospel now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded, with, commanded you. And remember, I am always with you. To the end of the age. There is a question and there's an impression of apparently contradictory narratives between what we read here in Matthew and briefly alluded to in Mark and also referenced implicitly in John's Gospel which seems to stand in contrast to what we read in Luke's Gospel and in Luke's accounts of the Acts of the Apostle. <clears throat> One is given the impression that they are both talking about the same event. In this account here, in Matthew's account, right at the end, we kind of imagine that this is the end of Jesus' earthly ministry and after this, or at this point, the ascension takes place. Actually, it doesn't say that. Whereas in Luke's account, both in the end of his gospel and the beginning of the book of Acts, this happened, this event happens, the ascension account happens, and it happens near Jerusalem. Whereas this happens in the north of Galilee. I want to suggest that this going to this mountain is probably Mount Hermon. It is probably, I want to suggest, the place of the Transfiguration. It's a high mountain. And having been in the region, I know that Mount Hermon stretches high above everything else. Mount Hermon is really on the border between uh, Israel and Syria. And from the top of Mount Hermon, one will be able to see right back, right through Israel, and also north into Syria. And it seems an appropriate place to give this great commission about going into all the world, where you can see both the land of Israel stretching to the south in front, but also the Gentile territory leading into the rest of the world stretching to the north. I want to suggest also that they are two separate events, that in this great commission, we see Jesus giving a picture of his disciples and his call on what their ultimate um, mission and ministry will be. It will be to the four corners of the planet. Interestingly, it takes them quite some years before they actually understand that and start to take it up. But that is another story. Whereas the Ascension account we see as ten days before Pentecost. We see from Luke's account that Jesus appeared off and on during the days after his resurrection for up to 40 days. And so there's quite a time period which takes place. The disciples are, are um, encouraged after that first week or so to go into Galilee, which is what they do. And here they encounter Jesus in various ways. And it would seem that at some point they return to Jerusalem and it's on the Mount of Olives, which is just close to Jerusalem, 
from which Jesus ascends after he's given instructions about the day of Pentecost, which is near, and what's going to happen in terms of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So there is this time separation, I want to suggest, that occurs. We pick up the narrative in verse 16. The eleven disciples um, went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And I've suggested that, uh, in my view, anyway, this is likely to be Mount Hermon. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. I, I like that. It's uncomfortable and it's unsettling, but it also has a sense of authenticity about it. Now, the most obvious conclusion is that they weren't sure that this was really Jesus, but perhaps he looked different now that he was the risen Christ. Um, and yet, I wonder, I suspect that it may be that Eugene Peterson's um, take in the message may be closer to it. I'll read you what he says. The moment they worshipped, the moment they saw him, sorry, they worshipped him. Some, though, held back, not sure about worship, about risking themselves totally. And I think, wow, yeah. Here they have been through this most traumatic of experiences. They had hoped so much. They had expected Jesus to have done so much and then to find him arrested and then crucified and dead and buried was heart-wrenching in the extreme. Their whole worlds had been ripped apart and they were only now starting to come to terms with them being put back together again. And here is Jesus reappearing and they're not sure that their hearts are ready to be broken so completely a second time. I think I kind of get that. It makes some sense and I think that uh, that Peterson might actually be on to it. But then he goes on to say, verse 18, Jesus, undeterred, went right ahead and gave them this charge. I like it. I like it. Jesus kind of rolls over the top of it and says, no, here it is. Here it is. All authority in heaven on an earth has been given me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Wow. This great commission to go. And it starts with these words, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given me. Well, it's an almost outrageous claim. Except that the one who is making it has just come back from death. And he's done it in the most remarkable way. He seems to be able to pass through walls and through doors. He seems to be able to be present and then quietly disappear at will. He claims to have attended to our sin, pro sin problem. And this is verifiable by those who have trusted him, trusted him for forgiveness, and have discovered the freedom, the wholeness, and the boldness that we've never known that he gives us. I've discovered this to be true. With countless of millions who are alive and have come before me, that he has injected a life-changing power into my life, which I know wasn't there before this continual, everyday encounter with him. And what is the call to his disciples? This call is to go and make other disciples. A disciple is a learner, a lifelong learner. And it's learning the way of Jesus. It's interesting that the early church, the followers of Jesus, weren't initially called Christians. That was quite some years 
later that they started to be called Christians. They were known as followers of the way. They were people who followed the way of Jesus. And we're invited too to be followers of the way of Jesus, to live in the kind of model that he showed, to be people who learnt to love and exercise generosity and openness and kindness and a, a fullness of spirit towards other people. That as people are with us, to use a contemporary uh, jingle really from uh, modern advertising, that they would look at us and say, I want what she's got. I want what he's got. That they would see what we have and that they would want it as well. There's a sense in the going that it's not just about a trip a long way away. It's also about a going now and it's about an everyday sense of going. Not everybody, in fact very few of us, seem to be called to go overseas. And yet, and they don't all go. Murray Robertson, who um, I sat in some ways under his leadership for many years, was 40 years the pastor at Sprayton Baptist here in Christchurch. And he'd had a longing to go to the overseas mission field. He was always, in a sense, a missionary at heart. Yet he always stayed at home, yet he stayed at home. And yet his church was a great missionary sending and a missionary supporting church. It was a church where people's lives were profoundly changed and people were released into mission and ministry both overseas and locally. And there's a sense that that's what we're all invited to, is to be going in our every day, a sense of every day that as we encounter others, that they encounter the Christ within us. Here's the thing though, there's a bit that I didn't read when I just read it the last time. The Great Commission also embodies the Great Promise. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This one who sends us, this one who sends us into the everyday, promises to be with us. This one who has all authority and commissions us for mission and ministry, promises that we're not going to have to do it on our own. This one is with us in every moment. The I am with you, God. He doesn't say I will be with you. He says I am with you. He is with you. He is with me in every moment. As we seek to live out the way his way in every moment of our lives and each day as we follow him. So friends, I encourage you that this one who was with us is the source of our strength, it's the source of our boldness, he's the source of the grace and the love which we have within us and are able to share. He's a source of the confidence that we can have to trust Him every day. I invite you, as post-Easter, we head off into the life that He's called us into, to trust His day by day, hour by hour, moment by moment presence with us, as He has promised. Amen.